first of all, we need to take a selfie. Y'all ready? Everybody smile real big. You're not smiling. <laughs> all right, let's take one more. Hold on a minute. That was terrible. Come on. I guess I made about five shots there. I didn't realize. Okay, good. How many preachers go up on stage and take selfies? All right, well, you'll understand as we go along. Well, this morning, I want to, uh, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me. We're going to go over to the book of Psalm, Psalm 131 to be exact. And uh, I appreciate the fact that today Robert is doing double duty today. Uh, not only is he uh, taking care of our screens this morning, but he's also taking care of the sound too all at the same time. So he's got his plate loaded today. That's not always easy, but uh, we appreciate that, Robert. Great job. Uh, he's been staying right on it. So that's great. Psalms 31. As you're getting there this morning, I just want to say that we're going to continue the subject or the topic of uh, free from the power of sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I love to understand that as a believer, I can live free from the power of sin. That doesn't mean that I don't have to encounter sin. It doesn't mean that I don't have a struggle with sin, but I can be free from the power of sin itself. And that's really important to understand. Just to give you a little uh, background on this, I'd like to say that uh, last week we talked about this whole topic of being free from the power of sin and, and uh, we uh, specifically talked about when it comes to this, uh, to this area of sin that we all want to find ourselves in a place to restart or reset. Remember we talked about that last week? To restart or to reset. We can find our, ourselves in a place, you know, and again, I used the illustration, have you ever done anything uh, in life where after it was over with, you just kind of stopped and you thought, man, if I could just go back and do that all over again. Remember that? We talked about that. Anybody ever experienced that? Okay, about three or four of you. The rest of you, you got it going on maybe. But for the rest of us, I there's so many times that I just like, man, if I could just dial back time just a little bit, I would reapproach that a whole lot differently. And we can all find ourselves in that place, right? And I think it's important to understand that when it comes to our life as a believer, we can, uh, we can find a reset. And that's important. We talked about this whole passage in Psalm, uh, and I believe it was in Psalm uh, chapter 51 and verse 10, where it talks about God creating me in verse 9, verse 10, creating me uh, a, a clean heart, right? And he goes on to say, uh, to renew a right spirit within me. And, and what that's talking about is a reset, a restart. God renew in me, reset me. So I just want you to understand this. When it comes to our life as a believer, there can be resets all the time. Thank God that reset doesn't rely on us though. Because I want to tell you, every time I try to reset anything, it seems it's like playing Jenga, you know? You, you just restack and then you start pulling things out until it gets wobbly and next thing you know it falls over. That's how good we are at resetting things ourselves because we self-destruct. Matter of fact, I used the illustration. How many of you live in Evansville? Let me see your hands. Okay, I figured so. All right, so if you live in Evansville, you understand potholes because that just comes along with Evansville, right? Now, when you're driving along and all of a sudden you hit a pothole, what happens? The front end gets what? Gets knocked out of alignment, right? So what do you have to do? <coughs> you have to go to the tire shop or somewhere and you got to pay a boatload of money to get your front end realigned again, right? Now, here's what I want you to understand. Humanly, and don't miss this, humanly, we are out of alignment 24-7. Some of us are more out of alignment than others. I'm just going to tell you, but every one of us are out of alignment. And there's only one thing that brings us into proper alignment, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ, period. That's it. See, and it's only when you go to him and will you find your realignment. But just as soon as you pull out of the shop 
you hit a pothole. Next thing you know, the car is pulling one way or the other, depending on how bad the pothole was. So therefore, it's almost like we have to live in the mechanic shop of Jesus to, for the realignment, constant realignment, constant realignment. Because here's what happens. Uh, if, if you're in a car and you don't get it realigned and you keep hitting potholes, what's eventually going to happen? car's going to go majorly off the road, right? If you ever drove a car or a vehicle and it's like you're fighting the wheel the whole time down the road because you're trying to do everything you can to keep a straight line, if you let go of the wheel, it's like, you know, it's like major pull. And, and that's the way we are humanly. We're on this, on this point where we're not aligned properly and so we can fight against ourselves all we want to but the unfortunate part is and see that's what we call uh, self-righteousness when we think we're doing really good at this ourselves, and, and what ends up happening when our car is out of alignment but we're doing really good at driving a straight line everything's perfectly fine right what's going on your tires are wearing out because you're pulling against the car in a way it's not intended to be pulled against it so the wheels are wearing out really fast and, and it's just not going to brake right. Matter of fact, when you put on your brakes, it's automatically going to kind of pull towards that one side of where it's un, not aligned right and it's going to want to pull heavier. That's what you got to give it even a little more and all this extra tension against this vehicle that wasn't made to be taken through all this takes a great toll and eventually it tears it apart all I can say is this humanly speaking we are out of alignment and when we think that we can hold it on a straight line ourselves, we're only fooling ourselves. we're still messing a lot of things up constantly because somewhere down the line your inattention humanly speaking is going to cause you to have some serious wrecks and accidents emotionally spiritually and on every other level so we have to go to the one who can renew us who can restart us who can reset us so I used the illustration let's say that this front seat right here in the auditorium is our own seat our own determination our own, uh, our own abilities and we're setting in that seat the only reset hear me out the only reset we can do I cannot reset myself and get it right in myself. I can't do it. Listen, now watch. The only reset I can do is if I'm sitting over here in this seat, which is my own doings, and I reset over into Jesus' seat, that's the only way I'm going to be reset. That's the only part of resetting I can do. Because what I try to do in my own flesh, in my own ways, is eventually going to fall apart anyway because humanly it doesn't last the only way it lasts is when I'm reset into the mind of Christ when I'm reset that reset is an inward surrendering to God that's what the reset is now hear me out this morning as we look at Psalms in chapter 131 I just want you to look these verses with me this morning and and, and here's what's going to happen. We're going to read the whole chapter. Now, I realize some of you probably might not be used to reading a whole chapter in church, but we're going to do that this morning. And as we read this whole chapter, when you leave, you know, you can even maybe say to other people, hey, we read a whole chapter in church today. How many churches read a whole chapter? You ready? Here we go. Look with me, if you would, beginning in verse number one uh, of chapter 131. It says... O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I did not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. There you go. We read a whole chapter. Now, I have to say it's probably one of the shortest chapters in the scripture, right? So now you've read a whole chapter for today. But you know what? There's a whole lot in that passage that I want to break open with you this morning. 
This morning's message is simply entitled uh, Free from the Power of Sin Dash Selfie. How many of you have ever done selfies before? All right, come on, be honest, be honest. I've seen your Facebook page. Don't even try to act like you haven't done so. selfies, right? I just took a, really, I didn't take a selfie while ago. I took an ussy, right? Because it was more than just, just one. There was all of us. So I guess we call that an ussy. And so here's the thing is that when we take a selfie, you know, now, listen, before cell phones existed and all that, how many of us, used to take a camera and take picture of ourselves or with somebody and we could take it without having to be on the other. How many of you have done that? Okay, about four or five of us, okay. I became a master of that when Betty and I got married because there was nobody to take pictures. We go to some really awesome places and it's like, we gotta take some pictures. And I'd turn the camera around, she'd say, you're not gonna be able to get this. You know, then we get them developed. She's like, how in the world did you get that centered up so well and everything? I got really good at doing the old selfie thing. We're the ones who invented selfies. I'm just saying, okay? I don't care who tries to take credit for that. We, we did it, okay? But we used to, used to take pictures with a camera like that. Now, here's the thing. What I want us to understand today is when it comes to our walk with God, if we're going to be free from the power of of sin, we have to understand that we are re, we have a restart or a renew that's found in Christ and Him alone. Now listen to the passage once again. At the very beginning of, I believe it's verse 9, it says, create in me. Is that a request being made, yes or no? You are slow to answer. Slow to wrath, that's all right. All right, yes or no answer, is that a request? If I asked you to create in me a blah, 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 am I requesting something? Okay, it's a request. So if it's a request, who is it a request to? Who do you think? Okay, God, right? The psalmist is requesting that God create in him and then later in the passage, in verse number 10, it says, it says, renew a right spirit within me. Is that a request? Okay, and who is the request to? To God. So therefore, if this is request being made to God, then we would probably come to the conclusion that the psalmist is writing his what on paper? He's writing a, a prayer, right? So he's praying. I don't want you to miss this this morning. When it comes to our life as a believer, if we're gonna have freedom from sin, we have to first understand that prayer is always the passageway to freedom, always. Our freedom is not found in ourself. It's not found in our ability. It's found in Christ and him alone. And the passageway of that freedom is prayer. You know, God wants to set you free. He wants to renew a right spirit in you, to create a right spirit in you. He wants to renew your spirit. But do you realize it's not, okay, I just need to, hum. I need to find my inner self. No, you don't. You need to find a relationship with Jesus. You need to have time spent with God. You need to have that conversation with the one who renews that right spirit in you and creates that new heart. Because apart from him, you can't do it. So in recap of last week's message, we talked about resetting or restarting. Here's what I want you to understand. That is therefore done through a conversation and communication with God through prayer because that's all prayer is, is communicating with God. And how often, ought we, uh, how often ought we to conversate with God? How often ought we to do that? Hmm? All the time. The scripture says to pray without, without ceasing. Now, does that mean I need to drive down the road with my eyes closed, my head bowed? No, that would be, that's not what God's saying. Is God saying we ought not go to work or not spend any time with our family because we need to go get in a closet and be alone 24-7 with God? Is that what he's saying? 
it would be impossible for that to happen. God didn't call us to go become a monk or to hibernate or to get away from everything and everybody. There may be seasons and times where we do need to get away. There may be times where we do need to get in a closet alone with God. Yes, but that's not where we're supposed to live. Remember when Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration and, and a few of his disciples were with him and he, they said, hey, let's build a tent for all that's going on here, three tents, and let's just stay up here and, and enjoy what, what you're doing, God. And Jesus said, but this isn't where the ministry is at. The ministry is down in the valley where people live. We're not meant to hibernate and find ourselves alone, but to be connecting and making a difference in people's lives. So how do, we, how do we pray without ceasing? What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Have you ever thought about it? To pray without ceasing has to do with an attitude of conversation and communication with God constantly about life itself and about what's going on and about decisions you're making and about those hardships and those hard times and those heavy loads in life that you have to carry that you're just laying it at the feet of Jesus and in your heart and in your spirit you're giving it to him that's what praying without ceasing is all about used to I thought it was about always having to get alone and get away from people and just get and, and, and somehow I felt guilty all the time because it seemed like I had a hard time doing that as much as I wanted to and maybe Satan's played that game against you too but I think we have to realize there comes a place and a time where we are striding along with God in such a way that we have a constant attitude of communication with God about life itself you know, when I drive my school bus, I am constantly, I, I can't say every second that I'm driving the bus, but a lot of the time I'm driving the bus, I'm having a conversation in my heart with the Lord about conversations I'm hearing going on on the bus, especially the high school or whatever. I'm like, Lord, give me the right things to say to be able to be an encouragement to them, to be a, a help to them. I had one girl one time on the bus, she had made the comment about killing herself or whatever, and I'm like, Lord Jesus, give me wisdom to know how to be a part of this conversation and how that I can find a place here. And so as she is getting off the bus, I, I said to her, I said, Hun, I said, listen, I just want to be an encouragement to you. What you were talking about a while ago is not an answer. That's not an answer. But I want you to know that I care about you and, and I want you to know I'm here for you and I want to have the opportunity maybe to sit down and talk with you if that opportunity could avail itself. I would like to be able to help you if I can. Well, then after getting off the bus that afternoon, I got with my wife and I said, Honey, I just this is eating at me. I can't take this. And so we got in the car and together her and I went to this girl's house and knocked on the door and, and started a conversation. And this young lady started coming to Milrow Baptist Church and coming to our youth group. And she began to find hope once again. I want you to know something. We can oftentimes find ourselves in some very dark, hard places. But I want you to know that what helps us have peace and to find direction and to find that reset in our life is to understand the pathway of that freedom is found in our praying and spending time with God. The heavy loads that my family's having to, to walk through right now. And, it, and I realize, I don't say this as though our family is carrying a load and you guys are almost, we're all a family and we're all carrying this load together. It's very personal with what's going on with my dad. And it's heavy. And it's a moment of time where it's a reminder that that walk with God is our sustaining force. It's that hope that lives in us, that apart from that, we're in trouble. And we find that peace in Christ and him alone. And the psalmist says here in verse number one, he says, O Lord. Now, again, that's not the right verse. Verse number one of Psalms 131. 
Um, oh, yeah, it is. I'm sorry. I was reading the title above it, and I'm like, where is that coming from? All right, we're there. Oh, Lord. So that that those two words are those, yes, I guess O oh is a word, right? So, oh, Lord, who is he talking to? Okay, he's talking to God. He's talking to the Lord. He's talking to the Lord, and he's saying, Lord, God, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. What is he saying? There's, first of all, a conversation that's going on with God. He's praying, and he's writing his prayer for us. And, and here's what I want you to see. When it comes to our life, if we're going to take a selfie, we need to do a selfie. It's called a self-examination. And that's the first thing we find here in this passage. We find that he says, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. What does it mean to be lifted up? What do you think he's talking about? Okay, what's that? Okay, puffed up or proud or arrogant or thinking more of itself than it ought to think. Oh, Lord, my, my heart. Now, is he talking about the blood pumping muscle? No. What is the heart? The heart of man is the centerpiece of who we are that makes us think and feel and make decisions and all that. That is our heart. And he's saying, oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. I'm not thinking more of myself than I ought to think. My eyes are not raised too high. And the King James it says they're not lofty. Now, the word lofty means to be lifted high. Or, you know, I was sharing with the first group that the word lofty, I think of a, a log cabin and you walk in and it has a loft. And if you go up the stairs, you go into the loft, you are now lofty because you've gone in the loft. And that's what it's talking about, to be above other people, to, to see ourselves as being high or lifted up as though we're somehow important. Now listen, I know none of you would ever have that attitude. You just wouldn't. You never would. You can't stand other people having that attitude and you would never have it because I know it's never come out of your lips that you've said to somebody, I can't believe that person did that. I would have never done that. I would have never chose to be with that person. I would have never picked that job. Listen to me for a minute. We're coming where we live right here. I'm pulling into your neighborhood. Here we go. Here's what's happening when we do that. We make ourselves the measurement upon which we evaluate everybody else. Well, I didn't do that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't wear that. I wouldn't this. I wouldn't that. And all of a sudden, what we're doing is exactly what the psalmist said he is not doing, and that is he's not lifting himself up as the measurement for everybody else. We have to find ourselves in this place if we're doing a selfie because at the end of the day, if reset is the responsibility of the Lord and only his responsibility to bring a reset in our life, then we have to understand what is it that is our part of this process because, and again, I said the only thing, I wrote it this way, I simply wrote it down so I could share it with you, that when it comes to our life uh, in reset, it comes from God and him alone. Our reset comes from God and him alone. But we have a responsibility. We are, there is an involvement we have to have in that reset. And that's what I want you to see today. If I'm gonna find my place, myself in a place of reset, I first have to find myself going through the passageway of prayer for that reset. But then once I get to that place and I'm praying, God, reset me, renew me, restore in me a right spirit, oh God. Then as I come up out of that prayer, I have to have a self-examination and make sure that I'm not thinking more highly of myself than I ought to think that I'm not looking at other people in a way that I'm, because when you look down on others, that means you're higher than they are. You've loftied yourself. You've put yourself in a higher place than other people when we look down on others and are judging others. My friend, listen, there's one judge. You know who the judge is? It's God. And he's really good at it. You don't have to bump him out of the way to play God. He's good at doing that. And he's got it all under control. 
At the end of the day, when it comes to our relationship with one another, just like my wife and I, when we got married, all right, for those of you that are freshly married or maybe you've been married for a few years, maybe you've been married for a while, maybe you got the attitude when I was younger, I thought, you know, the man's got to kind of be in charge of his home and got to make sure that everybody's doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And when I say everybody, it is true with your kids and all, and you got to make sure that that's going. But listen, I'm not the God of my wife. She got somebody much higher than me. Does a lot better job than I ever do. And I have found that most of the time when I get in the way of God, I only delay what God was getting ready to do. I step in the way and all of a sudden things kind of go foul. They go sideways. So what I had to do as a young man is to come to the place to realize I have a relationship with God and God is going to convict me and do the work in my life that he needs to do and he's going to do the same thing in my wife. And my wife had to come to the place where she had to accept that as well and that together when we love each other despite our brokenness and despite our fallacies, and we love each other anyway, knowing that God is not finished with either one of us, we're trusting God to do what only God can do. And therefore, here we are coming up on 28 years of marriage next month. Okay, that's pretty exciting. Thank you. That's pretty exciting. I remember when we first came to Mill Road and there was a couple that had been married 11 years and we'd only been married a year. And... Uh, and I remember they told us they'd been married 11 years. I remember Betty and I both looked at each other and said, wow, 11 years, that's amazing. And it is amazing, by the way. I don't belittle that in any way, shape, or form. In our day, 11 years, a long time, right? But 28 years later, I'm still amazed that God has kept two broken, saved by grace, people that don't make all the right decisions all the time a unit that's a God thing we can't take credit for that that's a God thing and the only way that happens is when we find ourselves resetting on God's side trusting God to do what only God can do realizing it's not through me thinking things out and, 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 and trying to somehow be in charge and in control Listen, I know there's people that I've had counseling with who have wanted new jobs or this, that, or something else, and, and, and they cross a line of trying to take over and be in charge. And I tell them, look, slow down and just trust God. You have done all that you need to do. You've put in your resume, you followed it up with a phone call to make sure they got it and this, that, and the other. But listen, all I'm saying is this, be careful that you're not trying to make something happen that's not meant to happen. Let's make that a little more realistic. How about when you go buy a house or a car and you already predetermine in your mind how much you're going to pay for it and we are not paying more than this. And yet we compromise when it comes down to negotiations because somehow we don't want to lose control of what we want rather than just trusting God to take care of it. My dad is a great example to me over the years of buying cars. I remember one time he went to the car lot and he uh, saw this car, had this price tag on it, and he told the car salesman, he said, look, I'll give you this amount of money for it. And the car salesman kind of chuckled. He said, yeah, preacher, it ain't going to happen. He said, we got to have at least this amount of money. He said, okay, well, I guess we won't be doing a deal. And he got in his car and he drove home. Three days later, the car dealer called him back and said, hey, if you still want that car at that price, you can come down and get it. Dad got in the car, went down and bought the car. That, my dad used to buy cars in the, about every two years. I don't even understand how he did it, but about every two years we had a new car or a different car. He loved his cars. But at the end of the day, he didn't try to make something happen. He got with God. He understood. He felt what God wanted him to do and how much he wanted him to offer. And he left it in God's hands. And if it wasn't meant to be, he was willing to walk away. You know what that's called? It's called trusting God. Not trying to be in charge and in control of everything. And I know we live in a world where everybody wants to be in control. We need to let loose and let God have control. 
So we find here in this passage, in this area of selfie, we need to do a self-examination. It's so important that we do that. Second, I want you to see as we continue to look at the passage here, it says in verse number two, but I have calmed and quieted my what? But I have calmed and quieted my what? Soul. Hear me out for a minute. Listen, be still and know that he is God. Stop it. Put the brakes on it. Quit trying to just run at a thousand miles an hour all the time. You gotta stop and know that he is God. Be still and be quiet and wait on the Lord and he'll renew your strength. We're so busy trying to be in control and in charge. And our OCD kicks in and we overthink and overexamine everything and we become critical in spirit. Next thing you know, we become paranoid because we think other people are setting up against us and they're maneuvering to try to hurt us and our mind. To, guess, you know who your greatest enemy is? It's you. You are your greatest enemy. And until you come to understand that, you will never defeat your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is you. You find in your heart and in your mind when things have got to go a certain way, you just put all your brain power and you think of things and you think of things that are way beyond what you ought to be thinking about. Verse number one. Things that are too high, too lofty, too lifted up. We think we have to understand everything. I've had people say to me, Pastor, until I understand all the different things about God, I'm just not going to believe in God. Listen, I can just tell you right now, faith comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of God. But at the end of the day, it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is sometimes not always understanding everything. The only thing you need to understand is God. That's where I find my solace and this valley that we're walking through as a family is, is I find that he's God. That's all that matters. Though I may wish things would go one way or another and though we may make our requests known unto God, at the end of the day, the comfort is found in knowing that he is God and that this isn't life. This is the land of the dying. The land of the living is beyond here. My dad, at one point, every one of us are going to be ushered into the land of life where there is no more death. Though it still leaves us with a lot of pain and hurt. I want you to know our trust in in God is not a matter of understanding everything. It's just a matter of simply setting still, being quiet, and knowing that he is God. And here I used another one was self-examination. Ready for a second one? If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Self-examination was the first one. Second one is self-determination. I am determined to be still and to be quiet. That don't happen on its own. You have to be intentional to be still and to be quiet. You can tell your kids, right? Be still and be quiet. And don't get up out of that chair. Oh my goodness. At that point, game on, right? I mean, they're in the chair, but they're twisting and turning and laying and, and next thing they're climbing under the chair and over the chair, but they haven't got off the chair there's nothing about being still and being quiet going on here. Do you realize our nature's the same way? We are so consumed with wanting to do and to go and yet we need to understand that we got to be still and know that he's God. We have to be quiet. We have to follow him and in that, that's where we begin to find in this next step of being free from the power of sin is being able to step back. You know what scripture says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? You familiar with that passage? 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, what? Acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. He'll set your course. You don't have to worry about it. Just trust him. Alan Jackson and I, one of our missionaries in Honduras, when he lived here and uh, before he became a missionary, he was, uh, he was the manager of All Rent Co. over on Weinbach, which now is uh, Signs to Go, I think, the building. But that was All Rent Co. And they used to rent TVs and all that. And that was right before Aaron, uh, Aaron's came into town. And he was a manager of that shop. And after he'd get off work, that once a week we would get together for prayer time. And so he would not go home for any longer than maybe to cram some food down his throat. And that was it. Now, sometimes he wouldn't get out of work until about 8 o'clock or so, depending on what time they closed that night, how busy they were, and the things he had to do as a manager to get the store shut down. But he would come over to my house, and sometimes it would be 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night when he'd get there. And then we would go to, and we lived over on Amstead Avenue, and we would go over the levee and down by... Uh, Pigeon Creek there and there was a spot a clearing that we would go and we would oftentimes take lawn chairs and sit down and just spend time praying with each other about this church about this ministry and about what God was going to do in using this ministry to impact our city and our world with the gospel of Christ and we would sometimes be there two, two and a half, three hours just spending time together talking and praying and I remember one night we got out there. It was about 9 o'clock or so. We'd been there for about an hour and a half, so it was about 10.30. And on occasion, we'd take a blanket and throw it out on the ground, and then we would kneel down on our face and just be praying. One night we were praying. All of a sudden, we heard this rustling right about, had to be a couple feet away from our head. I don't know if it was a possum or if it was a raccoon or if it was a snake. We don't know what it was. It was just cracking the leaves and the twigs within feet of our head. And the human nature is to do what? Is to look, right? What in the world is about ready to jump our head and attack us? But yet there was something inside my spirit that said, you know what? God, we're here at your throne. We're not even on this earth right now. We're at your throne room in heaven. And God, you're gonna have to protect our flesh. It's down there on earth because we're in your throne room right now spending time with you God, we're going to trust you not to do any, not to let this anything happen. You know how difficult that was? There was a war going on inside my flesh. I'm just here to tell you right now. I was ready to come up off that ground, right? I was ready to stand on that chair like a little girl. I don't know what that was. I just know this, that there came a point in a time of just trusting God, being quiet and being still and trusting him. Pastor, I'll do that as long as all the circumstances are right. Another time we're out there praying. And it had been cloudy all day, and it was getting, and this was an earlier part of the day. I think it was probably about, uh, it was on a Saturday, it was probably about 3 30, 4 o'clock. And we're out there just spending time praying, and all of a sudden the heavens opened up, and it started pouring down rain. We looked at each other, and it's like, what should we do? And we were just about to make the decision to get up and go in because it was raining so hard and all of a sudden we heard a voice. Right across Pigeon Creek was a golf course. And there were two people out there just golfing away. Rain and all. We looked at each other and said, if they can be that committed to their game of golf, why in the world will we get up because it's raining? knelt our head back down and we just stayed there and prayed now here's my point Oftentimes, we're willing to be still and be quiet as long as it's convenient to us but it's not always convenient and it's not always when we want to but it's always right when we stop and we wait on the Lord there is this point of self-examination there's this point of self-determination 
But I also want you to see in closing, there is a, there is a point. See, because here on self-determination, before I get off this, self-determination comes at place where we overthink things. We allow our mind to be consumed with over-examination. We get OCD about things. And we get paranoid. All right, now I'm pulling up in your driveway maybe. I'm guilty as charged. I look and I think and I over-examine things oftentimes and my wife sometimes got to be, got to be, a reminder to me you know what you just got to trust the Lord and in the power of his might and what he wants to do be still quit overthinking it we all have to stop it quit overthinking it quit becoming OCD about everything may I say that when we find ourselves in that place where we become the measurement that we base everybody else's decisions on, we find that we become the measurement of right and wrong and we think too high of ourselves. We must all find ourselves in that measurement of God and Him alone. Last but not least, self-desolation. The word desolation means a killing or a dissolving. Desolation has to do with obliterating. I didn't say that word right. You can say it. I'm not going to because I can't. To totally wipe something out. To desolate it. There comes a point in our life where we have to understand there is a self Desolation. We have to understand that we are nothing and he is everything. And when we start thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, then we find ourselves under the grips and we become slaves to the power of sin in our life. And until we're willing to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, the Bible says if we will, he will lift us up. That's where we find our victory. That's where we find our peace. Now, how do we do that, Pastor? How do we obliviate our own way of thinking? How do we destroy that way that we have of our own? It's found in this. The scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and and perfect will of God that we can find our renewing in Him that our renewal is found and by testing you may discern the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect that as we come before the foot of Christ in prayer as we walk through that pathway of freedom called prayer that we do that self examination that we become self determined to be still and be quiet and I don't know if you're seeing a whole theme of what's going on here this really comes down less of you and more of him It's not about what you can do. It's about what you need to let him do. That's self-desolation. Every head bowed and every eye closed.